بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم أعذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسألونك عن الساعة أيان مرساها فيما أنت من ذكراها إلى ربك منتهاها إنما أنت منذر من يخشاها كأنهم يوم يرونها لم يلبثوا إلا عشية أو ضحاها With the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I shall start this talk about the final hour Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the believers asking often the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam about the hour. They ask you, when is the hour coming? يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا فِيمَ أَنْتَ مِنْ ذِكْرَاهَا What would it benefit that they know the timing of it or why would they ask at the time you are one of its reminders fima anta min dhikraha you are indeed the one who warns people who fear it inma anta munziru man yakhshaha when they see it, the day they meet it, they would think they haven't spent on the face of the earth, that is to say, but one evening or one short morning. The hour is an idiomatic term for what follows resurrection until the people of Al-Jannah enter Al-Jannah and the people of fire enter Al-Fire. That is the hour. It's not an hour. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it in Al-Quran Al-Kareem an hour because the time of after death for the souls and from resurrection will change. Time is respective. And in our modern life now, on the face of the earth, we measure time by hours, minutes, and seconds. We measure time by days, weeks, months, and years. But on the day of judgment, all these will change. One day, maybe 50,000 years, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem, فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ On a day that is, or that counts, 50,000 years of what you count. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it an hour, وَيَوْمَ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةِ On the day, the hour takes place, يُقْسِمُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ مَا لَبِثُوا غَيْرَ سَاعَةِ The criminals, will make an oath, they will swear that they haven't spent, that is to say on the face of the earth, with all their lifespans, but an hour. 
all your lifespans. The criminals would consider it only one hour. It's like a dream. And they got up. They wake up to the realities of the world. Why? Because on the face of the earth, all human beings are on a journey. We've come from somewhere, we're heading somewhere. And on the face of the earth, our life, even if it lasts a hundred years, it's only temporary. And it's a journey. And it's not the final goal of human beings. The final goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created us in order that we know Him. He created us so that we worship Him in order to know Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. He offered us all possibilities, gave us strength, power, and the power of choice, the will with which we determine and decide what we want to do. He provided us with messengers, with guidance, with revelations coming down onto the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us every means of survival. It's up to us whether we can survive in this test or not. We're going all together to face this end, the day of judgment, the day of resurrection. I'm going to go through what's going to happen. But before that, I just want people to realize, to visualize the impact of that hour, the final hour. All what you do is to harvest one thing, success on the day of judgment. Not in business, in this life, not in your family life, not fame or a job or buy a house. All of that is nothing. Your major concern should be your survival on that day. For that goal, we all struggle on the face of the earth. The hour. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the hour is and should be more worrying and more bitter for everyone to think about it, to think about its calamities, to think about the agony human beings go through on the hour, to think about the tribulations, the pain, and how much of it we can take. Usually on the face of the earth, people cry if they are sick, if they complain of something, some pain. They can't even afford a pin sticking in their skin. They cry, they shout on the day of judgment. Look at the difference. Look at what humanity goes through on this hour when people are resurrected. Have we prepared for it? Have we asked ourselves what would be our state there? I don't mean by coming soon. I heard that the poster had uh, the final hour coming soon. This is about the lecture. Coming soon. The lecture is coming soon. Otherwise, we don't know the unseen. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran al-Kareem, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ تَكُونُ قَرِيبًا how would you know if the hour is very imminent, is close by? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Al-Quran, Al-Kareem. And this is during the time of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, who said, بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَةَ كَهَاتَيْنِ Pointing with his index finger and his middle finger to show how close he is and his message is to the hour to come. بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَةَ كَهَاتَيْنِ and he gave the example of this Muslim ummah in the scope of time of humanity altogether with a beautiful example. And this hadith is in Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari. مَثَلِي وَمَثَلُ مَا بُعِثْتُ بِهِ مَثَلِي وَمَثَلُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ مِنْ قَبْلِي كَمَثَلِ رَجُلٍ إِسْتَأْجَرَ أُجَرَاء يَعْمَلُونَ لَهُ عَمَلًا The example of me compared to other prophets مَثَلِي وَمَثَلُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ مِنْ قَبْلِي is the example of a man who hired workers to do some job for him. They started the job in the morning. They didn't finish it, but at noon time, they didn't want to continue. They said, we don't want our fee, and we don't want to continue the work. They left. He hired other workers 
employed them to finish the work. They started at Dhuhr, and at Asr time, they got tired. They said, we don't want to finish this work, and we don't want our fee, and they left. And he hired others to finish the job. They started at Asr time, they finished at Maghrib time, they finished the job, they got their fees, and the fees of the people who worked before them. That is the example of the Muslim Ummah. We came last, but we were best. We got our rewards and the rewards of the people before us because we believe in Musa alayhi salam and we believe in Isa alayhi salam and we did the job properly believing in the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believing in the revelations Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and in following the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers. But the example here, as Imam Suyuti rahimahullah ta'ala did use, the example here is given the day all long, the Muslim Ummah comes at Asr time. This is the example of the message of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. To the end of time, this is Maghrib time. So we have, the spot we have in the history of humanity altogether is from Asr till Maghrib. This is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ تَكُونُ قَرِيبًا How would you know if the hour is very imminent, it's very close by. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was the first sign of the signs of the end of time. He was the first of all signs. Usually the scholars classify the signs of the day of judgment into minor and major. And the minor signs started with the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his advent. The major signs, of course, are well known to start with the Dajjal, the Antichrist, until the sun rises from the west instead of the east. We seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the hour is coming and is very imminent. We don't know when. And 10 or 20 years, 70 or 80 years are nothing compared to our work, to our preparations for it. This is why when a man came asking the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Mata as-sa'a, as we read in hadith Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala, both in al-Sahihain, al-Bukhari and Muslim, Mata as-sa'a, when is the hour coming? It was a Bedouin who came. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam did not answer him. He did not answer his question because it is of no concern to any one of us. The timing of it does not matter. What matters? is our preparations for it. This is why the answer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was through another question. ماذا أعدت لها? What have you prepared for it? He made the questioner, the Bedouin, forget about his question. Intelligent technique. Because if he tells him it's going to be after a thousand years, or two thousand years, or a hundred years, or whatever, it's of no concern to that Bedouin. What concerns him and us is how to prepare for it, what have we prepared for it? This is the main question. What have we prepared for it? ماذا أعدت لها? So we should ask ourselves, throughout our journey, throughout our life, from when we are born, or at least from when we are mature and aware, or from these moments, when our minds and hearts are open to the facts, to the real facts in this world, everything else is an illusion. What have we prepared? Where are we heading for? Business, studies, travels, saving money. What have we prepared for the Akhirah? Little bit of action, some works. We boast in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're proud of. Compared to, to the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have done nothing. So this is the major concern of every one of us, everyone will be brought on the day of judgment and will be asked about himself and his works. And there will be more responsibilities also on people who have families. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha al-nasu wal hijara, alayha malaikatun ghilaadun shidaad, la ya'asoon Allah ma amarahum wa yafa'aloon ma yu'maroon. O ye who believe, ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, Protect thyselves and thy families against fire, naran. It's flames 
are mankind and stones. عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد. At its sides there are strong angels, big strong angels, who never disobey Allah and they do everything He commands them to do. ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. That is the obligation. قو أنفسكم. Protect yourselves against the fire. The hour is coming to be preceded by things and followed by things. Preceded by a series of actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set one after the other. And they all start by one event, death. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam said about it, النَّاسُ نِيَامْ فَإِذَا مَا تُنْتَبَهُ People are asleep. They wake up when they die. People are asleep. They wake up when they die. Death. Death is a probably, other than believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the principles of our belief as facts of this world, death is the most self-evident fact on the face of the earth. That no one can escape, and no one can deny, and no one can challenge. And all these scientists, kings, royalties, oppressors, all the people who have the money and the wealth of the world, they cannot protect themselves from death, no matter how much they put in front of them or they pay as ransom. Death is the reality that comes Often, all of a sudden, we're attached to life, and we like life. And you see, even people at the age of 80, they think they're going to live 20 years or 30 years more. Even at the age of 80, people have hopes in life, and they're attached to life. And this is, uh, by the way, for even people who do good, for good doers. Because even if they believe that they're going to Al-Jannah, people stick to life. Why? Because... They have a lot of things here. They have wives, children, grandchildren. They have homes. They have memories. They have things to take care of. They have business to pursue and so on. So with all of these things, even if they know that uh, after life, they're going to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're going to head for al-Jannah. They still like to stick to life. And they are given, if they are given the choice between life and death, they would choose life to death. But death will come to every one of us. Have we ever asked ourselves, when the angel of death comes around, what would be our case, what would be our state? One thing I like people to ask themselves about is, in what state would you like to die? In what state would you like to die? Would you like to die watching a movie? Or holding the Quran and Karim reciting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And maybe, maybe reading Salamu Qawla min Rabbi Rahim. Maybe reading Ya ayatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya fadkhuli fi ibadi wadkhuli jannati enter my jannah. Stopping here and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your soul. Maybe you die prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a book written about scholars who died while prostrating in a set of sujood. They died while in a set of sujood. One of the last scholars who died in a state of sujood was Shaykh Abu Fattah Abu Ghudda, rahimahullah ta'ala, a great Hanafi scholar, one of the great scholars of hadith. He died in a state of sujood. What a beautiful thing to, to have, to end your life with. But this means that you have to be ready for death. And you have to ask yourself about everything you're doing. Is it right? And if the angel of death comes now and takes my soul now, would you like to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that state? This is what you need to ask because everyone will be resurrected in the same state when they die. You die in your bed. Righteous people around you and you're saying, La ilaha illallah, 
you will be resurrected like this, saying, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Gossiping with people, sitting in a cafe, sitting in a nightclub, taking drugs, or whatever, you will be resurrected with the same state, doing the same thing. Especially with the, with the people who kill themselves. This is the worst. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa told about them. These people who kill themselves, like people who commit suicide. And similarly, people who are addicted to drugs and narcotics. These people are killing themselves. They will get on the day of judgment. They will be resurrected using the same drugs. Killing themselves. مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسَهُ بِحَدِيدَةٍ جَاءَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَحَدِيدَتُهُ فِي بَطْنِهِ يَجَأُ بِهَا بَطْنَهُ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمِ Anyone who kills himself with a piece of metal will be resurrected on the day of judgment with a piece of metal in his hand and he's stabbing himself in the fire. The same applies on everyone who kills himself. Those people who smoke tobacco, you're smoking tobacco. Would you like to be resurrected on the day of judgment smoking tobacco with your cigarette in front of you and you're just resurrected to face reckoning and to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are in that agony? Those people who stroll in the streets, young people following girls and looking here and there, wasting their times, young people, young generations, wasting their lives. Would you like to be resurrected doing the same on the day of judgment? That you would be resurrected doing the same of what you're doing now when the angel of death comes to take your soul. Or compare to the men of Allah, to the awliya, to the righteous people who die in their sujood, who die in hajj, who die in the Medina of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, who die in the masjid, who die reciting Quran al-Kareem, who die in a dars of fiqh or tafsir or hadith. What would you like to be? Death will come unexpectedly. When you expect death to come, it won't come. Until you forget about it. When you forget about it, then it comes. And no one has a guarantee or a certificate for a certain lifespan. No one is protected against death. No one can claim that I can't die as a young man. I'm going to live until I am 80. No one can claim this at all. This is part of the unseen knowledge. This is why we have to prepare ourselves every day and every night. Talking about death usually scares people. It's not a common subject, but I believe Preparing for it protects us from the worst calamity. If someone tells you, your home is going to burn, you're going to lose in your business, you're going to fail in your exams, wouldn't you take steps so that you are protected? And here's an imminent threat above our heads altogether. If we don't take serious steps to protect ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, we won't succeed. And the steps start from now. From now. Young and old, men and women, all of us, Arabs, non-Arabs, no matter how, what language you speak, no matter where you work, no matter how old you are, everyone is responsible. I'm talking about myself. I'm reminding myself. I'm the worst and I'm the first to be reminded, admonished of death and of what follows after death. I'm just reminding myself. So, the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said in one hadith that the angel of death comes in the nicest image and form for the believers and for the righteous believers and in the most scaring forms for the unrighteous believers and for the unbelievers. So everyone before leaving this world is given glad tidings or bad tidings, bad news about their next seats and about the future of their lives. When you see people frowning at death and shivering, it's a sign that they have been scared they are in a state of fear because of what they see, but they cannot tell. The angel of death comes in the most scaring form. Ibrahim alayhi salam in one narration asked uh, Malakul Maut, the angel of death, about his real image. 
He said, you can't see it. He insisted, Ibrahim insisted. So the angel of death came to him as uh, a man of the worst, ugly figure anyone could ever imagine. And this is how he comes to the unbelievers and to the unrighteous people. And in one uh, hadith also, both hadiths are weak, but they just shed some light on uh, the state when people are taken out of this life. Also, Dawood the Prophet, or Sulaiman the Prophet, peace be upon them, asked the angel of death about the best form when he comes to take the souls of the believers and he appeared to him in the best form. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam says, in a hadith agreed upon, in a sahihayin, مَا مِنْ إِنسَانٍ يَخْرُجُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا وَيُمَثَّلُ لَهُ مَقْعَدُهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ أَوْ مِنَ النَّارِ No human being leaves this world, but his next seat is shown to him before he leaves this world. But this is at the moment when you cannot tell. There's no words. But you see the believers with shining faces, with the ability to recite La ilaha illallah, with good believers around them. This is one of the benefits of being in the masjid. I was speaking the other day about the benefits of the congregation, that when you pray in the masjid five times, the community will ask about you, and if you miss one prayer, and they check on you, you're sick, people will come to you, and then the angel of death visits you, while the righteous people are reciting Qur'an, they are all around you. One of the beautiful things of being a part of a congregation, this is why as believers we're part of the ummah. And the smallest body of this ummah is represented in the congregation, in the masjid. The five daily prayers, the jama'ah you pray with, these are the closest brothers, sisters to you in the community. And this is... Uh, how you are part of the Muslim Ummah. And every masjid is part of the large Muslim Ummah, the large body of the Muslim Ummah. So people see their next seats. And then they are taken into washing and they're taken into funeral prayer. We have beautiful examples from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa tell us how important it is to do good to people. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting once. A funeral passed by him. It's one of the adab of funerals is to stand up. To stand up. The Prophet ﷺ stood up for a funeral, for Jinaza, passing by him. It was said, he's a Jewish man. He said, even, alaysat nafsan, is it a human being? For the respect of the human souls, it is uh, recommended that we stand up when a funeral passes by us. So a funeral passed by, the Sahaba around him spoke well of the dead person. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wajabat. Then another, another funeral passed by, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba around him spoke ill of the dead person. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wajabat. One of the Sahaba asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what is this word, wajabat? Wajabat. What is this word, wajabat? We know wajib, obligatory, necessary. So the Prophet ﷺ explained, you praised and you spoke well of the first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him al-jannah. Al-jannah is necessary for him. You spoke ill of the second, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him fire. Fire is necessary for him. Wajabat lahu nar It means which shows to us here the importance of the testimonies of people, of the true believers, of the righteous believers about a person. When a person leaves this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't leave his records unknown. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the tongues of people speak of him, either well or ill. This is why Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمَرْءُ حَدِيثٌ بَعْدَهُ all your life is summed up in a conversation between two people after you. Rahimahullah, he was a good man. Your life, 70, 80 years, all your words are summed up in, in a testimony. 
given by one person, your neighbor, your business partner, someone you borrowed money from and you paid off on time, someone you promised to do something and you fulfilled your promise, someone you helped. In the jama'ah, in the masjid, showing up all the time. Rahimahullah, he was all the time in the masjid. Rahimahullah, he was a good man. Rahimahullah, and so and so and so. Or else, oh, don't mention him. Oh, the earth got rid of him. Mustarihan wa mustarahun min. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said about, about a jinaza. Mustarihan wa mustarahun min. Aw mustarahun min. Either a man that uh, got rest of the exhaustion and the tribulations of this life, or a man, people got rid of him and of his evil. Mustarihan aw mustarahun min. That is the situation. You're one of these people. When people speak well of you, then you've got out of this world and actually you saved yourself the troubles of any remaining years on the face of the earth. But if God forbid people speak ill of you, then it is actually other people who got rid of you and are safe of your tribulations. Mustarihun wa mustarahun min. So testimonies, Ibn Dray, as they put that actually words, uh, these words of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala in a nice line of poetry. وَإِنَّمَا الْمَرْءُ حَدِيثٌ بَعْدَهُ فَكُنْ حَدِيثًا حَسَنًا لِمَنْ وَعَى وَإِنَّمَا الْمَرْءُ حَدِيثٌ بَعْدَهُ A human being, defining a human being. What is a human being? We're not here talking about uh, biology or talking about any other science. We're talking here about the ends. What is a human being? A human being is, is a tale after his death. That is a human being. That is your life. So what do you want people to say about you later on? Because when people say he's good, Ibn Atallah secondary put it in a nice piece of wisdom. The tongues of people are the pens of the truth. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the tongues of people to praise a believer, it means Allah is happy with him. And Allah ordered the angels to proclaim in the heavens and on the earth that I am happy with this person, with this believer, be happy with him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes all people happy with him. And vice versa. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the other case. But however, for a good believer leaving this world, death is relief, is not painful at all. Death is a relief. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in one hadith, الْمَوْتُ تُحْفَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ Death is a treasure for the believer. Tuhfa is something that is rare, a piece of antiquity, for example, a very expensive gift that you, you honor in your home. That is death. For the believer, death is a treasure. Because... It brings you sooner than expected the rewards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised you for your good works. That is the beauty of it. Until what time? Until what time? Until what time? You know that Bilal radiallahu ta'ala used to say, غَدًا أَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَصَحْبَةً غَدًا أَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ Tomorrow I'm meeting the beloved ones, Muhammad and his companions. Tomorrow I'm meeting the beloved ones, Muhammad and his companions. غَدًا أَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَصَحْبَةً Happy rushing! To meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of what he prepared and being sure of what he's going to meet on the day of judgment. Others, they run away from death. There's nothing to protect you from death. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says in a beautiful hadith also describing this life and the end of it, hadith in Sahih al-Imam Muslim, dunya sijnu al-mu'min wa jannatu al-kafir. Dunya is a prison for the believer. And a piece of garden for the unbeliever. This hadith, two words describing this dunya for the believers and for the unbelievers in two words. But look how eloquent the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam was in putting a concrete example in front of us. For the believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this dunya is a prison. So don't look for your pleasures on the face of the earth. If you are a true believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your real pleasures are not on the face of the earth. They are in the hereafter. A dunya is not for us believers. Al-Akhirah is for us. 
أما ترضون أن تكون لهم الدنيا ولنا الآخرة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says aren't you happy that they take the dunya and we take the akhira look at this beauty as a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you should know that this dunya does not belong to you and you do not belong to it dunya is for the unbelievers and for the unrighteous people who want to enjoy all the pleasures of this life for us and the hereafter is better for you than what comes first, the first life. The Prophet وسلم, we know how much he suffered while conveying the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed him, The Akhira is better for you than the first. But this addresses every one of us. Every one of us. This is why a dunya for the believers is like a prison. But unfortunately, we think wrongly that in this prison, we're given so many choices of meals, comfortable uh, dungeons uh, and cells, and uh, we're served. So we think that it's very comfortable. It's a prison. The example of, of dunya is like the example of democracy also. Like in the USA, democracy, people think we have a choice. We have a democratic system. We can choose. Our president is like a prisoner choosing between two meals. But if he opts for a third meal, there's no choice for a third meal. He can't get the third meal. Either this or this. That is democracy. The same also in this life. We think we have the choice to get whatever we want. But actually it's a prison. And the walls are far away from us. We don't see them. Dunya sijnu al-mu'min. It is Jannah for the unbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the unbelievers, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Don't extend your eyes, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ to what we have gave them of the pleasures, إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ pairs of them, أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا The flower of this life, lower life. Why did Allah give the unbelievers the flower of this life? Alinaftinahum fi to test them with it. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprived you from something of this dunya, be happy. Because you are not under test. Definitely, you're not under test. Test is when Allah gives you, and it is worse than when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprives you. Because you're responsible. Where did you get it? Where are you going to spend it? It's very difficult. This is why Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, a great Egyptian scholar, he's called Amir al-Mu'mineen in the Hadith. He's the famous commentator on Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari, author of Fatih al-Bari, Sharh Sahih al-Bukhari. He was once walking in Cairo, in Egypt. And the ulama at the time had a lot of respect. And they had a lot of luxury, a lot of uh, students around them, luxurious mount, and so on. So while he was walking with people around him, like a king, a Jewish man approached him, was very poor, and his dress, his clothes were very dirty. He used to sell hot oil. And you could imagine a person working in that profession, how would his clothes would be and uh, his uh, general state. So the Jewish man approached, uh, penetrated the crowds and approached al Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and asked him, نَبِيُّكُمْ يَقُولُ الدُّنْيَا سِجْنُ الْمُؤْمِنِ وَجَنَّةُ الْكَافِرِ فَأَيُّ سِجْنٍ أَنْتَ فِيهِ وَأَيُّ جَنَّةٍ أَنَا فِيهَا Your Prophet says, dunya is a prison for the believers and jannah for the unbelievers. What type of prison are you in and what type of jannah I am in? Look at the answer of Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. قال أنت بالنسبة لما أعده الله تعالى لك من العذاب في جنة وأنا بالنسبة لما أعده الله تعالى لي يوم القيامة من النعيم في سجن. You are compared to what Allah prepared on the day of judgment for you of the torment and the punishment you are in جنة. And I am compared to what Allah prepared for me on the day of judgment of the pleasures of the جنة. I am in a prison. Why is people? How they think. So even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a lot, 
of uh, Naim in this life, don't think that this is uh, Jannah. It's a prison because what you've been promised is much more, much more beyond imagination. This is what we should prepare for. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam also in a hadith in, in Jami' al-Imam al-Tirmidhi says, الدُّنْيَا مَلْعُونَ مَلْعُونٌ مَا فِيهَا إِلَّا ذِكْرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا وَالَاهُ وَعَالِمًا وَمُتَعَلِّمًا Dunya is accursed. There's nothing in this dunya that is praiseworthy except dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that comes in conformity with it. وَمَا وَلَا And a scholar who teaches the deen and a learner who studies the deen. وَعَالِمًا وَمُتَعَلِّمًا All of it is accursed. لَوْ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا تُسَاوِي عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَاحَ بَعُوضَةً مَا سَقَى مِنْهَا كَافِرًا شَرْبَةً مَا If all the dunya was equal to a fly's wing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have provided a glass of water to an unbeliever. It's worthless than this. A dunya worth nothing. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa was walking once in one of the streets of al Madina Munawwara and he saw a dead sheep that got rotten and smelled very bad. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa turned to the Sahaba and said, do you think that people could have benefited from this in any way, could benefit from this in any way? They said, no. If there was any benefit in it, they wouldn't have thrown it away. The Prophet also said, dunya is worthless than this dead sheep. Nothing of it to get benefit from. So when you leave it, you should be happy for leaving it. But very few people have this understanding and they yearn to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, ending life is haram. And no one is uh, in this world supposed to end his life in order to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not even asking for a uh, rush death or for a short life. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alayhi wa said, Allahumma ahyini ma damati al-hayatu khayran li wa tawaffani ma kanati al-wafatu khayran li. Oh Allah, make me alive as long as Life is good for me, and take my soul, if taking my soul is better for me. That is what we are recommended. But yearning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes people always do good, more than anyone else, and anything else. Yearning to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one will yearn to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except those who have done good. Others, they have to pay their debt before. Give me a chance, give me an opportunity. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in one hadith, don't ask to die. Because if Allah prolongs your life, it's either good your earning or an opportunity to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're given. Which is good. So don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shorten your life. Either good your earning and you're going to earn more and more of it or you're giving another opportunity. Allah will give you another opportunity to repent to Him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends your life to repent to him. When you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, you're going to see your place in al-Jannah, or the unbelievers will see their place in fire from before leaving, the last moments, in their deathbeds. And then, they head to their graves. In the grave, have you prepared for that answer? When the two angels come to ask you, what's your religion? Ma dinuk? Al-Islam. Ma rabbuk? Who's your Lord? Allah. مَا تَقُولُ فِي هَذَا الرَّجُلِ الَّذِي بُعِثَ فِيكُمْ They point out to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the ulama did used from this, that you're going to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Do you know his description? Can you recognize him? Because they say, مَا تَقُولُ فِي هَذَا الرَّجُلِ الَّذِي بُعِثَ فِيكُمْ And هذا is a demonstrative pronoun. Pointing out to him, there is ishara, there is mushar ilayh, there is mushir here. Demonstrating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. What do you say about this man who was sent amongst you? Then, will you be able to say he's Sayyiduna, he's our master, Habibuna, he's Rasulullah, he's Nabiullah, he's Khatamul Anbiya wal Mursaleen? It's only people whose life is ended and has ended with good works who will be able, will be eloquent, will be assisted in order to answer that question. Then if you answer well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens from your grave a window to Al-Jannah. And you are in na'im, in pleasure until the hour to come. 
And people who fail to answer will be in torment, in punishment. And the window from their graves will open to fire and they will be in punishment until the day of judgment, let alone other specific punishments for some specific sins people may have committed, such as if they don't pay zakah, if they don't pray five times prayers a day, or others, then there are specific punishments. For example, in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu a huge serpent, snake, will come to people who don't pay zakah in their graves. And the punishment of the people who don't pray five times a day, also in their grave. This is different from the punishment in watching the fire and getting the flames of the fire to your graves. Have we prepared? And what have we prepared for that? Then it's all from the moment of death till the moment of resurrection. You're either in na'im, in pleasures, or in azab, in torment, until the hour to come. And when the hour comes, people are resurrected from their graves. And then the hour comes, and it's agony. And the, the torment of the hour is beyond imagination. And there comes the roar of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. People are drowned in their sweat because of the sun coming very close to the heads of people, up to their earlobes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says. They seek some exit, resort out of this uh, calamity. No one helps, no one is able to help from a prophet to another, from Adam alayhi salam to Nuh, from Nuh to Ibrahim, Ibrahim to Musa, Musa to Isa, Isa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who intercedes and who takes this calamity away from people just for the reckoning to take place. This is called al-shafa'atul uzma fi fasli al-qada, the great intercession in the reckoning to take place. All these agonies are before the reckoning. Then, the annals will be spread, and the scale will be held, and people's actions will be weighed against the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, and against their sins. And one example Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives us about a person who was given eyesight, and who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one narration for 500 years. He comes on the day of judgment being very proud of his worship, of his ibadah, and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be admitted in a jannah because of his works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Adkhilu abdi al bifadli. Let my servant be in al jannah out of my bounty. Qala bal rabbi bi amali. Nay, because of my work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Let my servant be in al jannah out of my bounty, out of my mercy. The person insists, thinking that the worship of 500 years deserves to be rewarded by Al-Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders a scale third time, and all of his ibadah is put on one side of the scale, and on the other side of the scale, only one bounty, the eyesight. The eyesight. We don't appreciate a lot of the bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. A lot of people complain that they are poor, right? If I ask people here, what is uh, the most urgent request you all need? Probably money. Money. I want to pay off my debt. I want to buy a house. I want to have a good salary. I want money. Money. And people complain. They don't have enough. Imam Ghazali, and before him, Imam Abu Talib al-Makki in Qut al point out to an important issue. Allah has given you your eyesight. Do you sell it for 10,000 dirhams, he says? It was a lot of money at that time. Do you sell your eyesight for 100,000 sterling pounds? Anyone in this masjid here, the masjid is full, mashallah. Anyone in this masjid sells his eyesight for 1 million pounds, all you need is go home, make dua, Allah takes your eyesight and gives you in return 1 million pounds. Anyone wishes for that? You have one million pounds. Okay, let's talk about hearing. Anyone wishes to lose hearing, ask Allah to take it back and give you in return one million pounds. Anyone wishes for this here in this masjid? No one. Other faculties, the same. Let me tell you about something else we don't appreciate. Knowing Surah Al-Fatiha. Reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Anyone wishes to forget Surah Al-Fatiha for the rest of his life and get 10 million pounds. Anyone wishes for this? 
Anyone wishes to forget Surah Al-Fatiha for the rest of his life and get in return 10 million pounds. No one dares. I see it. So you appreciate? See the bounty of knowing Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Ikhlas, the word La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, or Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil, or inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, or la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim, or subhanallah wa alhamdulillahi wa la ilaha illallah wa allahu akbar. See how many millions you have now. You've got in your pocket. Allah has given you. And you think you're poor? The bounty of eyesight is put against the worship of 500 years. And the worship of 500 years is nothing. It flies in the air because of the heaviness of the bounty of the eyesight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let my servant be in fire out of my justice. The person beseeches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requests Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and begs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till he is admitted in al-Jannah. So this shows to us, dear brothers and sisters, how much we need to struggle in order to survive when our books are opened. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we get our books, first of all, in our right hands. And in order to get your books in your right hands, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا If you want to get your book in your right hand and given an easy, it's a sign that your reckoning will be very easy when you take your book in your right hand and you return to your family members in Al-Jannah with a lot of happiness. The first sign of success is if you're given your book and you take it with your right hand. If you want to take your book on the right hand, you have to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in this life so you hand over things. And you take things always with your right hand. So that when the book is offered to you, you extend your right hand. You know, my father, rahimahullah, fell ill several times. On some of the occasions, I used to help him or dress him with his uh, shirwal or with his socks. Preparing him, for example, for the doctor to come or for going out. And sometimes he would be sleeping or once he was in a state of coma. He was in a state of coma. And I started, I was a young boy. I started uh, dressing him his socks. And I wrongly started with the left uh, foot. And he folded the left leg and extended the right leg. And this is in a state of coma. He's aware of the sunnah, even in a state of coma. Why? Because sunnah became part of his life. The tissues of his life, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You won't make a mistake on the day of judgment if you practice the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you take everything with your right hand and you hand over everything with your right hand. Then your name will be called on the day of judgment to take your book. You offer your right hand and you take your book with your right hand, inshaAllah. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers all of us, inshaAllah, our books with our right hands. It is out of the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if some of us enter al Jannah without reckoning. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the good news that 70,000 of his ummah will enter al Jannah without reckoning. يَدْخُلُ مِنْ أُمَّتِي سَبْعُونَ أَلْفًا الْجَنَّةَ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ قَالُوا حَلِّهِمْ لَنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا هُمُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَكْتَوُونَ وَلَا يَتَقَيَّرُونَ وَلَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ They are these people who do not practice the pre-Islamic practices, such as uh, soothsaying, for example, and being pessimistic, and those people who rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One Sahabi, you might be aware of this story, one Sahabi, his name is Ukasha or Ukasha, both are correct, Ukasha ibn Mihsan, was amongst the Sahaba who heard this statement. And he said, Oh Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, make dua that Allah makes me one of them. He said, you're one of them. We make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us some of them, inshaAllah. In one other narration, this hadith is in Sahihain, in both Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. But in a narration also in other books of hadith, وَمَعَا كُلِّ وَاحِدَ مِنْهُمْ سَبْعُونَ أَلْفَ With every one of them, 70,000. Will enter a Jannah without reckoning. If you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't ask a Jannah. Ask for the highest ranks of Al-Jannah. If you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask because you're asking the most generous one. But with your questions, with your requests, with your dua, you have to put some efforts. 
Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the beatific vision to see him because this is the most important pleasure on the day of judgment. Ask for the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Al-Firdaus Laala, but prepare yourself for the good company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he is pleased with you there when he sees you and he calls you to him, not rather that you're pushed away by the angels as it happened. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa described to us what will happen on the day of judgment. People will be pushed away from him because they never practiced his sunnah or never turned to him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Prepare yourself, ask a lot and ask for the best. Because you're asking the most generous, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the sirat, the bridge will be held. The bridge is sharper than the sword. And the bridge of sirat is over Jahannam. And people will pass over the bridge. Some of them like the winds. Fast like the winds. Some of them like the fastest horses. Some of them running. Some walking. Some, even some crawling. The last person enters Al-Jannah uh, creeping, the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam tells us. And people who are distant for fire will fall off because there are what we call pieces of metals that takes people from the right and from the left coming from the fire. Kalalib takes people from the right and from the left to fall in fire. We seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's just a short description. I haven't gone through everything. If you read what has been written, what has been narrated by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, you won't imagine the type of fear people will have of fire and of what follows the hour. My intention was not to scare people away, but rather to give high himma to every one of us to prepare for the hour. Because we have a lot of hopes. This is why I mentioned People will enter a Jannah without reckoning. People will be given their books with the right hands. There are a lot of things. If you do, Allah will give you Husnul Khatima. Husnul Khatima to end your life with La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. A lot of things. If you do, Allah will give you Husnul Khatima. Look for them. Starting from the five daily prayers in the masjid. Starting from the company of good people. Starting from being around shaykhs, learning the deen. Doing good to people. Following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And you will be given signs. And there are a lot of things also. You do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep you fast on a sirat, on the bridge, on the day of judgment. You don't fall right or left in fire. There are things if you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you your right, your book with your right hand. The Prophet told about sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So we have a lot of good news about the hour. We have a lot of good news as believers, as Good doers, inshallah, but we have to have good himma. We have to ask ourselves, where are we heading for? In these societies here, with the evil of, those, of, of these societies invading our lives. People are thinking nothing but business. People are thinking nothing but the pleasures of this life. People are thinking nothing but this short life. There is afterlife. That is the most important concern of every one of us. Our ends, where are we going to head for after death? And the moments of death, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn away all people from you, even your own children and mates, husbands, wives, will not be able to help you at that moment. It's only your good work that you prepare throughout your life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us preparing good works before us on the day of judgment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us energy, stamina, strength, to get rid from laziness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our hearts with the light of Iman, with the love for Al-Quran, with the love for the Masajid so that we frequent the Masajid more and more. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the love for the awliya and the men of Allah and the people of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us getting rid of the dunya and the attachment of the dunya. To get what we need of it to survive in this life and to spend the rest of our lives in worship of Him in service of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to end our lives and seal our lives with La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah And that we get the shafa'a of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We drink from his basin, that we get our books with our right hands, that we pass over the bridge, 
that we are in Al-Jannah and in the highest ranks of Al-Jannah, in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the beatific vision that is given to the people of Al-Jannah every day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, to forgive our parents, to amend our children. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from every evil, the evil of the shaitan, the evil of the sultan, the evil of these societies, the evil of the unbelievers, the evil of riba, the evil of drugs, the evil of crimes to protect our children from every evil and to protect us and to reward the people who put us together in this masjid, the people who build this masjid, the people who are taking care of it, and to reward all our Muslim brothers and sisters who have come here and answer all our dua and our requests. Bijahi Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.